3D printing has come a long way over the last five to 10 years. There's even an entire ecosystem now being built just for prosthetics and orthotics. We have a lot of machine choices and material choices. We have 3D scanners in our pockets and we have design software made just for O&P. With this ecosystem being built out, it's starting to make a lot of sense to integrate 3D printing into our patient care workflows and into our fabrication facilities. But this also brings up a lot of questions, important questions that we need to answer like, what is 3D printing? How do I use a 3D printer? And how do I integrate this into my facility? Three D printing might seem like a new industry, but it's actually been around for over forty years. The first patent was filed in nineteen eighty, and throughout the eighties, three types of three D printing were created. These were resin-based systems, and powder-based systems, and there are also filament-based systems. All three of those are still in use today, and it was the expiration of those early patents over the last decade or so that has created competition in the marketplace. This has led to improving quality and access to better stuff at lower prices. With that, we've seen a boom in 3D printing that makes it seem like a new industry, but it's actually just more accessible now for small businesses whereas 3D printing used to be mainly used in research settings and industrial facilities. One of the questions you might have is, why is 3D printing called additive manufacturing? Additive manufacturing is the technical term. It's the opposite of subtractive manufacturing. In additive manufacturing, 3D printing, we start with nothing. We have a digital file and a blank slate. Our 3D printer then builds up your product by making one layer at a time until you have your final shape. Subtractive manufacturing is the opposite. You start with a large piece of material and then you cut or grind away from it to create your final product. We have a couple good examples of subtractive manufacturing in O&P. The best is probably a CAD CAM foam carver. These machines take a large block of material and then you grind away from it to create the final shape of a limb or a socket. And we use those to thermoform or laminate sockets and AFOs. A couple other examples may be more obscure, but reducing the volume of a plaster model or the thermoforming itself where you start with a large sheet of plastic and you shape it and then you cut away what you don't want. These could all be considered subtractive manufacturing in their own way. These methods all have something in common beyond that though. They're all wasteful. They waste material. And then you waste time and effort when you first make the mess and then you have to clean up the mess. And all that wasted material and time and effort leads to wasted money and business inefficiencies. So 3D printing is not just new and cool. It's actually a way we can increase our business efficiency by increasing our profit margins on our fabrication side of things. It's also important to note that a switch to 3D printing doesn't mean we have to get rid of jobs. We don't replace technicians. It's just that the skill sets change. And in this changing work environment, the clinicians, the fabrication, even the businesses themselves have to change and adapt. It's up to all of us to increase our skill sets to make sure we stay relevant in a changing work environment. So getting back to the three types of 3D printing, we have resin, powder, and filament systems. We're gonna cover the basics of all those here today. And if you wanna know more about any of them, go to the discussion forums at lemonlattice.com and leave any questions in the 3D printing section. The first to be created was the resin system. This was called stereolithography, and you might see it abbreviated SLA, which is a stereolithography apparatus. There are also variations of that. It's MSLA, and then there's DLP, DLS, HARP. There's a lot of abbreviations in 3D printing. And in resin printing, it's important to know what some of the differences between these are if you're looking to use it. 
So resin's great for a few things. It can make really highly detailed parts with great surface finishes and things like squishy shock absorbing lattices. So these are why I first started looking at resin printing. But what I found was there's also a lot of issues like weak parts and things that over cure over time and then get brittle. And that's because the way resins work is it's a, it's called vat polymerization. So it's a liquid container of resin and then a light source cures it layer by layer until you have your final part. Some of these are done with lasers, some are done with LCDs, but they all are UV cured for the most part. So over time with UV exposure, these parts continue to cure until they over cure. Now, some of the higher industrial grade things have uh, UV inhibitors or they work in different ways that make the printing more reliable. But generally speaking on a small scale, you know, things that we might have in our homes or small businesses, resin printing is gonna have a lot of issues for O&P. There's also a lot of post-processing involved, which would be things like cleaning all the unused resin off of the parts at the end, and then having to either uh, do a one-stage cure with UV light or a two-stage cure where you have to bake and then put it in UV light. So the, the resin itself is often toxic. It's a skin irritant, and it's got a lot of smell with it. So although we can make some really cool things, and I think there's a good future for resin printing if we can harness these lattices and other things, right now, it might not be the best option for O&P, but you know, everyone, everyone's got their own ways of using things and you might disagree. And if you do, I wanna talk about that. The next system created after resin printing was powder bed fusion printing. This started with something called selective laser sintering, which is SLS. So SLS is still used a lot, and a similar process is gonna be MJF, which is multi-jet fusion. So MJF is from HP, uh, Hewlett Packard, just like with your computer printer you're used to. And their process uses some of that same inkjet technology to bind these powders together in a different way. So both SLS and MJF start with a thin layer of powder that's laid down, and then SLS will trace out the shape of your part with a laser, whereas MJF will lay down two types of ink first. One's a fusing agent and one's a detailing agent. It then comes across with an infrared heat lamp and the areas with fusing agent are fused and the areas with a detailing agent are not. So the difference there is you're gonna get a smoother surface and a little bit of a crisper looking finish on an MJF part compared to an SLS part. So even though the, the surface looks different, internally they're, they're pretty similar in a lot of ways and they're both very strong. So powder bed printing gives you an isotropic strength, which means it's gonna have equal strength in the X, Y, and Z axis. It's these properties of it that make it really good for O&P use and why you've probably seen it so far. So end use things like definitive sockets and AFOs and cranial remolding helmets. All of these things so far are being made primarily with SLS or MJF when they're used in O&P. And this is different from some of our other processes. So a little bit different from resins and filaments where you might have an anisotropic strength where you're not gonna have equal strength in all directions, and then you have to account for that in the way you design and print them. So even though the powder bed printing is really strong, like everything, it's got its own drawbacks. The SLS and MJF systems tend to have a lot of post-processing need, and they also have a lot of expense, both upfront and in material costs. So the systems themselves can be very expensive to buy, and they're also very large. So you're gonna have your printer, you might have extra build units, uh, you're gonna have post-processing stations and maybe some stuff to, to clean and tumble the surface. There's gonna be a lot that goes into these powder bed systems. 
And you're going to have to have the space and the environment built out to be able to work with those. But again, if you're trying to make something end use, these are really well, uh, well developed and proven technologies so far. They're doing a great job in O&P. The third system developed and the one that we're going to use with our lemon lattice content was filament printing. So this started with a company called Stratasys and they started with FDM, which is fused deposition modeling. And when their patents were about to expire and other people wanted to start making filament printers, the FDM is a trademarked term. So other people started making theirs called FFF which is fused filament fabrication. So there's a small difference between the two, even though the names are sometimes uh, interchanged with each other. And that is that an FDM printer is gonna have an enclosed and heated build chamber, whereas FFF printers will not. So that comes into play mainly for the higher grade materials, um, it, you know, things like aerospace and medical implants using materials like uh, Peak, which is P-E-E-K, uh, and things like Ultum you might see. So those are, are really advanced materials, super strong with great properties, but they're harder to print and you have to print them at higher temperatures and you have to have the right environment, which is why they have the heated build chambers. For most of what we need to do in O&P, we don't need to worry about that because those are really expensive materials and we don't necessarily need those properties for everything we are trying to make. So that's one of the great benefits about filament printing is we have a lot of choices. We have a lot of choices on materials, a lot of choices on printers, and we can get those at a wide range of prices. So the artillery sidewinder here is a little over $400. Uh, and you can get other printers that are five, 10, 15, 20,000, or, you know, significantly more than that. But a lot of it comes down to the materials themselves instead of the printer. So as long as your printer can handle the material with the temperature it needs to be printed at, the, uh, the environment it needs, the build plate temperature, as long as your printer can do those things, you can print those same materials and get pretty similar results from a $400 printer or a $40,000 printer. So some of the things we can make in O&P, uh, you know, just a traditional test socket, we can use clear PETG. And that's gonna change based on your printer. That is one of the things that a high flow printer can print you a thicker wall. So you can print a lot faster, but also a little bit clearer. Whereas the, the cheaper printers with uh, the smaller flow rates to them, it's, it's how much material it can push out per second. Uh, those are gonna have to do it in a different way that's gonna be a little slower and not quite as clear, but still a fully functional test socket. So another benefit of these is they're a consistent thickness. You design that rather than being at the mercy of however your vacuum forming works. So with test sockets and flexible inners, we can know exactly what kind of product we have. We can know what strength it's going to have, and they can also be replaceable. So we have TPU materials, which are very similar to our traditional flexible inner plastics. So those can be basically a direct swap from what you're used to. And then we also have hybrid versions of TPU like VarioSure that is sort of like a hybrid between uh, plastic and a foam. So you can actually increase your, your softness, your cushioning, some of those things. Um, we can also use TPUs for covers, a lot of cool things we can make there. So a lot of what we do in OMP can be directly translated to filament printing, and that's why that's where we are going to start. In our next video in the 3D printer series, we're gonna get into the details of filament printers. 
what do some of the design styles mean, like Delta or Core XY or Cartesian? We'll figure out what those are and how they affect function and what you might want for what you're trying to do. We're also gonna look at desktop versus professional versus industrial grade. What are those classifications and what are the price points of them and what can you expect to get for your money at each of those price points? That's also gonna lead us into a different discussion on economics. So if you're trying to do O&P in-house with a filament printer, what can you expect to pay per part for a test socket or foot orthotics or a cover or a WHO? We'll look at a lot of that. And we're also gonna cover materials. So this will be another series, our material series. And in that, we'll go over a buying guide for filament. We'll get into how to use and care for your filament. And then we'll also down the line get into types of materials and how to specifically use each one. So be sure to check back for those and we'll see you next time.